Welcome to Chronicle of the Times. A haggle of witches from England, Scotland and Wales. The United Kingdom has a rich history of the supernatural. In today's episode, we have collected some stories of witches within England, Scotland or Wales. A bit of history. A genuine fear of witches was a real thing in England for quite some time. Henry VIII passed an act against witchcraft and conjuration in 1542. King James I, Queen Elizabeth I, heir, was known to have a considerable fear of witchcraft, believing witches to be a threat to his reign. We have included a range of stories from news publications of the day. The stories range from 1594 until 1808. We hope you enjoy the show. It seems appropriate to start with a very early case of witchcraft, the sad case of Gwen Ellis in Wales. The first woman to be hanged for witchcraft in Wales, 1594, Gwen Ellis. Gwen was born in 1542 at Clandymog in Wales. She was raised by an uncle and lived with him until she married. Gwen was unfortunate with her husbands. The first husband died after two years of marriage. Her second husband died after 18 months of marriage. Gwen was a spinner, making linen cloth. On the side she made salves, ointments and remedies for animals and people. She also did healing and protection through the means of charms. Gwen's payments for this service was usually gifts of food or wool for her loom. At this time, the role of the local herbalist was looked at with both good will and fear. It was thought that a person who had the power to heal could also have the power to harm. All was well until Gwen left a charm in the Mostyn's household. The Mostyn family were members of the local gentry. It was perceived that Gwen had now taken her spells and applied one to a member of the landed gentry. The charm that was found was a type of poem that had been written backwards. It was interpreted as having been left to harm the Mostyn family. Background. Gwen had been well treated by Jane Conway of Marl Hall. Bad blood existed between the families of the Conways and the Mostyns. A charm had been found, and Mostyn claimed that Gwen had placed it in their house while he was away with the intent of causing harm to him or his family. It was believed that this had been done at the behest of Jane Conway. Gwen was arrested by William Hughes, Bishop of St. Asaph, who took her for questioning at Flint Castle. Gwen was adamant that she had done nothing wrong. She insisted that she had left no charm in the Moston house. Within the interviews, Gwen admitted that she had used charms to help people, and she was proud of her abilities. She recited one of her many charms to the investigators. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God, and the three Marys, and the three consecrated altars, and the blessed Son of Grace, and by the stones and by the herbs to which the Son of Grace bestowed their virtue, in order that they should defend thee, the sinner who suffered adversity as Christ defended. For our listeners. Religion was a contentious issue during this time. Queen Elizabeth I was queen during the investigations into Gwen's practices. Catholicism could be regarded as treason and was generally looked upon with suspicion. 
Gwen's clear reference to Catholicism did little to help her. Searches were made of Gwen's home. Inside they found a bell without its clapper. There was a Christ figure showing him rising from the dead, and she said that they had been given to her by her sister, but it was enough to link her to the old ways of the Catholic Church. In prison, she was quizzed further. It was suggested Conway had employed her to leave the charm at Moston's home because of their quarrel. Despite insisting she was innocent, the magistrate ordered witnesses to be gathered. Five men and two women came forward with accusations of witchcraft for her trial in October 1594. The most serious allegation came from a 60-year-old widow, Ellen Birch Richard. She claimed Gwen had sent her son mad and was responsible for his death. Others said Gwen was vengeful. Griffith ap Hughes of Betis said she had made his sick brother David ap Hughes worse by charming him with salt. Bailiff William Griffith ap William of Betis accused Gwen of putting a demon fly into his drink. He also said Gwen was responsible for a friend's broken arm and bewitching his friend's wife as she had lost the use of her arms and legs. Gwen was found guilty and at 42 years old continued to protest her innocence and she was hanged in 1594. Note, retrospectively through letters found, it has been conjectured that Gwen Ellis was actually more of a victim of illicit knowledge. It would seem that Mostyn had had an illicit affair with Jane Conway and Gwen knew of it. The evidence of the charm such as it was had been fabricated by Mostyn with a view to ensuring Gwen's silence forever. The Newgate Calendar was a highly popular collection of crime stories that took place across England in the 18th and 19th century, although it also contained historical recounts from stories from the 17th century. This article recounts some of the witchcraft history. From the Newgate Calendar, Witchcraft The reign of James VI of Scotland and first of England may be said to have been the witchcraft age of Great Britain. James I of England wrote and published a treatise on demonology, the purpose of which was to resolve the doubting hearts of many as to the fearful abounding of those detestable slaves of the devil, witches or enchanters. Under the reign of James I, many Hundreds of unfortunate creatures in both countries became victims, suffering death ignominiously for an impossible offence. It was the most hapless and inoffensive, such as aged and lone women who were the most exposed to the malignant operation of witch hunting. There were persons regularly employed in hunting out and bringing to punishment those unfortunate beings suspected of witchcraft. Matthew Hopkins, the Witchfinder Matthew Hopkins resided at Manningtree in Essex and was witchfinder for the associated counties of Essex, Suffolk, Norfolk and Huntingdonshire. In the years 1644, 1645 and 1646, accompanied by one John Stern, he brought many to the fatal tree as reputed witches. He hanged in one year no less than sixty reputed witches of his own county of Essex, the old, the ignorant, and the indigent, such as could neither plead their own case nor hire an advocate, were the miserable victims 
of this wretch's credulity, spleen, and avarice. He pretended to be a great critic in special marks which were only moles, scorbutic spots, or warts, that frequently grow large and pendulous in old age, but were absurdly supposed to be treats to suckle imps. His ultimate method of proof was by tying together the thumbs and the toes of the suspected person, about whose waist was fastened a cord, the ends of which were held on the banks of the river by two men, in whose power it was to strain or slacken it. Swimming upon this experiment was deemed a sufficient proof of guilt, for which King James, who is said to have recommended, if he did not invent it, assigned a reason that, as some persons had renounced their baptism by water, so the water refuses to receive them. Sometimes those who were accused of diabolical practices were tied neck and heels and tossed into a pond. If they floated or swam, they were consequently guilty, and were therefore taken out and burned. But if they were innocent, they were only drowned. From James I and Matthew Hopkins, the famed witch-hunter, we jump to the story of the Lancashire witches. The Lancashire witches remain a famous story that is still remembered today. The case revolves around two matriarch-led families. The matriarchs of both families are in their eighties and vie with each other as herbalists and healers. But they were also contacted to cast evil spells upon people whom their clients held a grudge against. From the Newgate calendar, the Lancashire Witches, a more melancholy tale does not occur in the annals of necromancy than that of the Lancashire Witches in 1612. This story is in Pendleby Forest, four or five miles from Manchester, remarkable for its picturesque and gloomy situation. It had long been of ill repute as a consecrated haunt of diabolical intercourse, when a country magistrate, Roger Noel by name, took it into his head that he should perform a great public service by routing out a nest of witches who had rendered the place a terror to all the neighbouring vulgar. The first persons he seized on were Elizabeth Demdike and Anne Chattox. The former was eighty years of age and had for some years been blind and principally subsisted by begging. Although she had a miserable hovel on the spot which she called her own. Anne Chattox was of the same age and had for some time been threatened with the calamity of blindness. Demdike was held to be so hardened a witch that she had trained all her family to the mystery, namely Elizabeth Device, her daughter, and James and Alison Device, her great-grandchildren. These together with John Balcock and Jane, his mother, Alice Natter, Catherine Hewitt and Isabel Roby were successfully apprehended by the diligence of Noel and one or two neighbouring magistrates, and were all of them by some means induced, some to make a more liberal and others a more restricted confession of their misdeeds in witchcraft, and were afterwards hurried away to Lancaster Castle, fifty miles off. To prison. Their crimes were said to have universally proceeded from malignity and resentment, and it was reported to have repeatedly happened for poor old Demdike to be led by night from her habitation into the open air by some member of her family, where she was left alone for an hour 
to curse her victim and pursue her unholy incantations and was then sought and brought back again to her hovel, her curses never failing to produce the desired effect. The poor wretches had been but a short time in prison when information was given that a meeting of witches was held on Good Friday at Malkin's Tower, the habitation of Elizabeth Device, to the number of twenty persons, to consult how, by infernal machinations, to kill one Lovell, an officer, to blow up Lancaster Castle, deliver the prisoners, and to kill another man of the name of Lister. The prisoners were kept in jail till the summer assizes, but in the meantime the poor blind Demdike died in confinement. The other prisoners were severally indicted for killing by witchcraft certain persons who were named and were all found guilty. The principal witness against Elizabeth Device was James Device and Janet Device, her grandchildren, the latter only nine years of age. When this girl, nine-year-old Janet Device, was put into the witness box, the grandmother, on seeing her, set up so dreadful a yell, intermixed with dreadful curses, that the child declared that she could not go on with her evidence unless the prisoner was removed. This was agreed to, and both brother and sister swore that they had been present when the devil came to their grandmother in the shape of a black dog and asked her what she desired. The grandmother had said the death of John Robinson when the dog told her to make an image of Robinson in clay and after crumble it into dust and as fast as the image perished the life of the victim would waste away and in conclusion the man would die. This testimony was received, and upon the conviction which followed, ten persons were led to the gallows on the 20th of August, and Chattox, of eighty years of age, among the rest, the day after the trials, which lasted two days, were finished. Such was the first case of the Lancashire Witches. From the Lancashire Witches of 1612, we jump to 1738 in Faversham. A poor woman received alms for the poor, is regarded as a witch by one of the helpers. This short news story describes what happened to the poor woman. From the Derby Mercury, January 1738. Faversham. Murder of a suspected witch. A barbarous murder was lately committed on Jane Plain by Stephen Diaper, one of the most stupid villains that ever was formed with human shape, of which the story is as follows. Mr. James Bunce of Offspring near Faversham gives annually every St. Thomas Day a certain measure of wheat to every poor woman that comes and asks for some. Among the number was Jane Plain, a poor woman of unblemished character, aged between sixty and seventy years, who was ordered by Mr. Bunce to have the measure. The villain, who was ordered to measure the corn, took it into his head that this poor creature was a witch, and bethought himself of a stratagem which he had heard to know them by. This was that no witch had power to receive more than a measure, which proved to be the death of this innocent creature. For her modesty was so great that she told him, as seeing the heap measure, that his master did not allow of it, nor did she desire more than he was willing to give. This, and this only, urged on her fate, for she no sooner refused, but he drew his knife and stabbed her, as I am informed, in above forty places. Mr. Bunce was in the room at the same time with a child in his arms, and two others by his side, not knowing where the villain would stop, 
His first care was to secure the children, then calling three other of his servants, went and seized the ruffian who gloried in the action. This story of 1751 tells the tale of what happens when a mob has made the decision that a family are actually witches and the extreme measures that the mob takes. From the Broadsides, 18th of April, 1751. Thomas Colley. On the 18th of April, 1751, a man named Nichols went to William Dell the crier of Hemel Hempstead in Hertfordshire, and delivered him a piece of paper with fourpence to cry the words which were written on the paper, a copy of which is as follows. This is to give notice that on Monday next a man and a woman are to be publicly ducked at Tring in this county for their wicked crimes. This notice was given at Winslow and Leighton Buzzard, as well as Hemel Hempstead, on the respective market days, and was heard by Mr. Barton, overseer of the parish of Tring, who, being informed that the persons intended to be ducked were John Osborne and Ruth, his wife, and having no doubt of the good character of both the parties, sent them to the workhouse as a protection from the rage of the mob. On the day appointed for the practice of the infernal ceremony, an immense number of people, supposed to be not fewer than five thousand, assembled near the workhouse at Tring, vowing revenge against Osborne and his wife as a wizard and a witch, and demanding that they should be delivered up to their fury they likewise pulled down a wall belonging to the workhouse and broke the windows and their frames. On the preceding evening, the master of the workhouse, suspecting some violence from what he had heard of the disposition of the people, sent Osborne and his wife to the vestry room belonging to the church as a place the most likely to secure them from insult. The mob would not give credit to the master of the workhouse that the parties were removed, but rushed into the house, searching it through, examining the closets, boxes and trunks, and even the salt box in search of them. There being a hole in the ceiling which appeared to have been left by the plasterers, Collie, who was one of the most active of the gang, cried out, Let us search the ceiling. This being done by Charles Young, with as little success as before. They swore they would pull down the house and set fire to the whole town of Tring unless Osborne and his wife were produced. The master of the workhouse, apprehensive that they would carry their threats into execution, informed them where the poor people were concealed, on which the whole mob, with Collie at their head, went to the church and brought them off in triumph. This being done, the mob conducted them to a pond called Marlston Mere, where the man and woman were separately tied up in a cloth. Then a rope was bound round the body of the woman under her armpits, and two men dragged her into the pond and threw it several times. Collie going into the pond and, with a stick, turning her from side to side, having ducked her repeatedly in this manner, they placed her by the side of the pond and dragged the old man in and ducked him. Then he was put by, and the woman ducked again as before, Collie making the same use of his stick. With this cruelty the husband was treated twice over, and the wife three times, during the last of which the cloth in which she was wrapped came off, and she appeared quite naked. Not satisfied with this barbarity, Polly pushed his stick against her breast. The poor woman attempted to lay hold of it, but her strength being now exhausted, she expired on the spot. Then Colly went round the pond collecting money of the populace for the support he had shown them 
in ducking the old witch, as he called her. Collie was taken into custody, and when his trial came on, there being a variety of strong proofs of the prisoner's guilt, he was convicted and received the sentence of death. The day before his execution, he was removed from jail of Hartford under the escort of 100 men of the Oxford Blues, commanded by seven officers, and being lodged in the jail of St Albans, was put in a chase at five o'clock in the next morning with the hangman, and reached the place of execution about eleven, where his wife and daughter came to take leave of him. Then the minister of Tring assisted him in his last moments, when he died exhibiting all the marks of unfeigned penitence. His body was hung in chains at a place called Gobblecut, near where the offence was committed. Further activities against the family continued after the execution of Thomas Holly. The broadside continue. Two ignorant and deluded people, H. Ibbelson and his wife, were committed to Wakefield House of Correction for violently assaulting and wounding E. Berry, their niece, who had been lately married. These ignorant people, having conceived the idea that the young woman had bewitched them, formed a plan to draw blood from her in order to dispel the charm, and meeting with her in the marketplace, they both suddenly assailed her, the woman biting and scratching her while her husband stabbed her in the body. We finish this episode of Stories of Witches of another mob story that takes place in 1808, similar to the previous story, the torture inflicted on the perceived witch is terrible. From the Oracle and the Daily Advertiser, the 24th of November, 1808. It was devoutly to be wished that all belief in witchcraft had been long exploded, but the following circumstance, coupled as it is with the utmost barbarity, will prove that it exists not more than sixty miles from the metropolis. Anne Izard, an elderly dame of Great Paxton in Huntingdonshire, was lately accused by her neighbours of having bewitched three persons of the names of Alice Brown, Fanny Amy, and Mary Fox. The superstition was so strongly confirmed by the overturning of a cart drawn by a restive horse, the property of a grocer in the village, that her neighbours resolved without delay to inflict upon her summary punishment they thought she so justly merited. The cottage in which Anne lived with her husband, Wright Izard, is at some distance from the body of the village of Paxton. Thither they marched in the silence of the night, and having reached the door of the poor man's house, they broke it open and inhumanly dragged his wife out of bed and threw her naked into the yard, where her arms were torn with pins, her head dashed against a large stone of the causeway, and her face, stomach and breast severely bruised with a thick stick that served as a bar to the house. In about four days after this, finding the old lady still alive, they paid her a second visit and treated her with the same cruelty as before. Learning that she was not dead the next morning, they resolved to see whether she could not be drowned at night. But fortunately for all parties, this experiment was frustrated by the timely removal of the poor object to a neighbouring village where under the protection of a worthy clergyman she now lives free from the further persecutions of her barbarous and ignorant neighbours. That concludes this episode of A Haggle of Witches in England, Scotland and Wales. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We are aiming for 1,000 subscribers. You have been listening to Chronicle of the Times, 
and I am Robin Coles.